So my name is Eric. Uh, I've been working on the Gearman stuff quite a bit lately. Um, I work at Sun. I also work on the Drizzle team, and we're doing a lot of things in Gearman and Drizzle together, um, especially in the future. So I'm going to give you a little um, overview of how Gearman works, starting with a history, what's been going on lately. Uh, give you some really simple examples, and then dive into a few use cases. Um, you know, give you an idea of what Gearman actually is and what it, what it can do and be useful for. So it started out at Danga. Um, this was Brad Fitzpatrick's company, which spawned off Live Journal and eventually got bought by Superbar. They, you know, as you know, made things like Memcached D and Pearl Val and Mobile FS. And Gearman D was one of the lesser known technologies that came out of there, but um, Gearman is used inside of Mobile FS and does all their distributed coordination. Um, especially for Im image resizing at LiveJournal when everyone's uploading pictures of their kittens and whatnot. You know, you don't want to do all that you know, image resizing and processing on the server. You want to push those out to, a, to a, basically an image farm to do those conversions. So there is a need for that. And as Brad gave in one of his talks originally about it, it's an anagram for manager. So Gearman doesn't actually do anything useful itself. It just pushes work around and coordinates things, but it's, you know, alone it's completely useless, but it depends what you build on top of it, you know, what engineering you do with it. Um, it's used at, of course, Live Journal, six part, um, gig, it has a pretty big installation of it. Yahoo also has a, one of their departments, I'm not exactly sure where or how they're using it, but they have a pretty good cluster of it. And after all those started coming out, um, some other language interfaces came up. And Brian, I think about a year and a half ago, Brian Akers started doing a rewrite of it in C. You know, he saw this is really useful technology, but it doesn't perform too well because the whole thing's in a Perl. Um, nothing against Perl for using it as you know, client APIs and whatnot, but when the coordinating job server is in Perl, you know, you start hitting limitations, especially when pushing large objects around. So he started to rewrite in C, and then I designed a similar system just on my own before ever hearing of this, and I met up with him at OSCON last year, and we're like, oh, this sounds a lot like Gearman, so rather than reinventing the wheel again, I joined um, and started working on the Gearman stuff. So it's fully compatible with the new C implementation. It's fully compatible with all the existing APIs. Um, we've introduced a new PHP extension, which is based on the C library, so it's a lot faster than than the existing PHP. We added MySQL EDFs so you can fire off, you know, like background jobs and run Gearman clients inside of your, your select queries, which you'll see later. There's a new command line interface, which allows you to do really quick debugging and uh, testing of new ideas. You can even do things like write MapReduce clusters in shell script, which sounds kind of useless, but you can do some pretty cool stuff for, you know, sysadmin type things like, you know, aggregating all your logs, and this is an example I'll show later. We've added some new protocol stuff, and as of about 30 minutes ago, we just released a new version 0.5 of the job server, which is now threaded. So we're, some preliminary tests we're seeing, we're pushing about 30,000 jobs a second for an A4 box, so we're starting to scale really well. So the basics of how Gearman works, we have we have a number of ways you can use Gearman, so the most generic way to describe it is a distributed application framework. Some people use it as a asynchronous queue, some people use it to just coordinate jobs between a large number of machines, you know, doing synchronous transactions, so you can use it a, num a number of ways. It's normal TCP IP client server communication. Um, originally it was port 7003, so this is something to watch out for if you install the Perl version. It will use 7003 and they just pick that port out of the sky and it directly conflicts with the AFS3 port range. So I applied to IANA for a real port number and now everyone's changed their default port to 47307. So if you see, oh, I started my client worker and I can't talk to anything, it's probably because of port mismatch with the Perl versions. So at the core, you have three components, a client, a worker, and a job server. Clients produce work to be done, workers actually do the work, and the job server coordinates the work between those two entities. 
So it's a really simple concept. I mean, you know, it's a it's an idea that's not original in any way. You know, every shop has something like this. You know, especially that are trying to scale. So you know, we're not you know creating all this new and exciting technology. We're just trying to create a a consistent way of doing it that a lot of people can coordinate and you know be a part of a community. You know, so everyone's not inventing their own and trying to fight the same issues. A few good benefits is that it's obviously open source. Uh, all the C stuff is BSD, so there are no restrictions on what you can put this inside of. So if you want to sell your proprietary app that needs to speak your man, that's just fine. It's multi-language, and they're all you know compatible using the same protocol. So you can have a PHP worker talking to a C lot to a C um, client, and you, know, you can match, mix and match any way, which allows really good upgrade paths. If you prototype everything out and you know Perl or PHP code, then you're seeing bottlenecks in your worker code. You can just rewrite those in C, and you know your performance is just going to go up. So there's some some flexibility there. It's been compared in some ways uh, to MapReduce type things, you know, like Hadoop and, and other technologies like that. And the difference with Gearman is that you're not restricted to a design pattern. You're not reduced to you have to here's your function and you have to do you know reducing here and you have to you know, split up your work. You can actually design it any way you want. It's kind of an ad hoc system. With the new C stuff, it's really fast, um, similar protocol, so there's not a lot, a lot of overhead, you know, no latency and you know multiple packets going back and forth just to run a job. It just can be fire and forget, and you know you don't have to worry about it. It's really small and lightweight, so you can stick it into existing applications easily, and you can also push that. Um, while it can fit in small applications, you can also use it to build really large, robust systems. So it depends how you want to use it. And there's no single point of failure. So if you need a cluster that needs guaranteed uptime, as long as you have power to the entire cluster, nodes can fail um, at any of the three levels, client, worker, or job server, and you're going to be just fine. So your typical application stack looks like this, where you have, you're writing your own client code and your worker code, and everything in between is taken care of for you. So if you know, a worker dies, you know, in the bottom end, a job server manages restarting it. You know, it, the job server also manages doing the natural load distribution, so you can choose the, you know, most optimal um, worker to do the work for you. You end up having to only worry about your application code and a couple simple API calls, you know, dealing with a C or, or any language interface, you know, dealing with one of these APIs for the client to work. A really simple cluster would be set up like this, where you can have clients configured to talk to one or more job servers. And workers, you know, would typically use the same set of job servers, although there are interesting topologies you can make if you want to start splitting those up. And the job server, you can run multiple instances. So if that first job server around the left, you know, drops the machine core hard, you can have the clients just automatically fail over to the second job server. And the workers will stay connected to all job servers, so you're guaranteed that no matter where the job ends up, there's going to be your same pool of workers ready to pick that work up to be done. And this is also important to show that um, with being able to run multiple job servers, you don't have that single point of failure, which some other you know, equivalent systems deal with. Like they may have some you know, coordination server that if that dies, you know, you have to do a failover, you know, to some you know. Uh, secondary server or something like that, where this everything's treated equally and it leaves up to the application to manage, you know, any coordination. So how is this actually useful? You get natural load distribution because with all your workers connected to a job server, they're just going to pull when they're ready to do something. You're not trying to coordinate like, oh, this machine is really loaded, so I have to shut down workers. If you, if you have a 16 core box and you have 16 workers running on it, if they're all busy doing something, you don't have to worry about it. They're not going to ask for more work to be done. It's not shoving work to the workers. The workers are, are, it's not a polling mechanism, but it's a notification mechanism where they know when to ask for it, if they are idle. It allows you to push a lot of application code um, closer out to your, where your data is. So if you need to do some you know, really MapReduce-like stuff, um, and you want to compute, you know, maybe it's either data intensive or CPU intensive, 
having that worker code out there in your cloud or out in you know, some cluster, that's going to be a lot more powerful than shipping all your data back and having to do the analysis you know, on, your, on your client machine. The other um, strong point to mention there is since you're able to write that worker code yourself, you're not relying on some existing system like you know, a typical RDB, RDBMS um, you know, to provide enough you know, to provide enough in its built-in language either through SQL or stored procedures or triggers to, to get that functionality you need. You're not working with operator interfaces like user-defined functions to be able to, you know, give you some application-specific logic in a place where maybe it doesn't belong. This gives you that middleware layer to, you know, to put your own um, application code on. For things like MySQL and Drizzle, you get the UDF interfaces, so you're able to you know, fire both synchronous and asynchronous jobs out from your database, either as part of your queries or as triggers or stored procedures. And you can do things like building your own MapRace cluster. And, and like I said before, the design patterns in Gearman are kind of unlimited. You can do a traditional approach like MapRace, or you can, you know, just do something ad hoc and just let your workers and servers coordinate amongst themselves. So in MapReduce, you you know typically have a top level client that will you know have some big chunk of work to be done. It pushes it down to an intermediate worker, which splits that work up into small bite-sized chunks that are easier for you know your leaf nodes to process. That that intermediate piece will then um, you know concurrently all send those sub jobs down. The workers can produce those, and then that intermediate worker can aggregate all those results back and give you know some consistent view or or you know some useful meaning data, meaningful data that came back from those those workers. So one way to design a system like this in Gearman is you have a client talking to a job server, then you have a worker in Gearman, but it also acts as a client. So you're taking the client job that was sent down, splitting it up, running in this case only four clients concurrently, and it ships them all down. And as the workers respond, that MapReduce work in the middle can can sit there and aggregate the results, you know, possibly, you know, doing a, a merge sort or something like that, and giving some, you know, some meaningful answer back to the client. So, how does this actually look in the code? Now, stepping away from the MapReduce example, um, just a really simple, you know, client worker. You take the client, um, for the client code, you're going to make a really you know, simple program that's just going to send a string off and it's going to return the reverse of that string. It's kind of like the hello world of Gearman. So you create a client object, you add a, a set of job servers, in this case only one job server connecting to the local host. You say, go do this function named reverse, which is the first argument, and the payload for that function, or basically the arguments, is hello world. Now, in all the interfaces, the workload is completely arbitrary. You can have some packed binary structure, you can use Google protobuffers to uh, serialize your data. You can, if you know you're in entirely a PHP shop, you can do like, you know, PHP serialize. And anything that you want to shove down there is just a, you know, a blob in length. And it'll pass it along. Then, so that client do call is going to run, wait for a return, and then print out the result of whatever, whatever was returned. In this case, we're only working with strings, so we don't have to deal with the, the binary nature. Now the worker code, creates a worker instance, adds the same set of job servers as the client, then adds a function, and this add function call actually communicates with the job server and it registers with it saying, I can do this function in reverse. Every time you get a job for that, if I'm asleep, wake me up. Or if, you know, what I'm asking for, and, you, know, you, you know you can give me one of these. Every time it gets that, uh, a job for a reverse, it's gonna run this callback function, my reverse event. So when you drop down to the next line of that infinite loop of just you know working nonstop, every time it picks up a job, it'll fire off this callback function. It's going to pass the job object in, and that has some other useful information, but the, the main thing you care about is the workload that was sent. In this case, it's going to be the string hello world. And then you're just going to run that through a function, and whatever that function returns is what gets sent back to the client. So as you can see, it's not much code. It's really simple to you know, to prototype up some, some quick planning workers. So if you actually run it, um, you run the gearman D, which is the job server. 
Um, Dash D just forks it into the background. You run the PHP worker in the background, and then you run the client, and you can see you get back that hello world in reverse. Looking at MySQL, and we're almost ready to have the Drizzle UDFs done, and next we're going to start looking at some Postgres hooks. Um, and inside of the databases, you it doesn't make sense to have workers in there. Um, although in, Gear, or in Drizzle, we're doing some other interesting things, but what really you know is important inside of these you know queries and uh, and triggers and whatnot is the power to do you know asynchronous jobs, especially. But in this case, we're just saying set this you know like in that PHP code, select the uh, set of servers and. I just put in a select, but you could, you know, set a variable equals to that. You just need that function to be run in some way. And then you say, gearman do reverse hello world, doing the same thing that that PHP client did, and the result sets back. Now, in order for this to work, of course, you need the gearman job server, and you also need the, uh, you know, a reverse worker running. Now, one interesting thing about this is that, um, when you're running, when you're running these, you're not you're not just getting a distributed application framework, but for things like MySQL, you're actually extending your UDF interface to you know multi languages. So you can run a Gearman do function, and you may have you know a worker written in any language that's more application specific. So if you really need a UDF that's written in Perl, but you can't really plug that in easily to MySQL. Um, you can now do that with Gearman, and you can run all this on the same host. And if you see, oh, these Perl workers are really starting to eat into the CPU load of my um, my SQL instance, just start up another machine and have the workers run on a separate machine. So you can run everything on one machine and scale out easily to to remote nodes. So the first use case, which is one of the things I've seen people using for, it, is URL processing. So you have some collection of URLs for some purpose, um, RSS activating, search indexing, maybe image manipulation, and you want to cache or extract some information out of it. So in this example, we're going to use MySQL for storage and using their triggers on tables. And then Gearman is going to be an asynchronous queue, and we're also going to get some concurrency out of it by you know, allowing to have multiple workers on it. We're also going to use Gearman background jobs. So in Gearman, if you're a synchronous job, you're, you're just a normal job, and that's it. If you're a background job, that means you're asynchronous, which is you're sending something out, and the client just disconnects, and you don't care, you know, if that's, you don't care about the result that the worker may return to you. Now, doing this thing of having these workers connect through TCP to the job server, you get this easy scale out so that, oh, I have a worker that's really busy, um, or you know, our set of worker nodes are really busy, just throw another machine there, fire up more workers, have them connect to the job server, and you've just expanded your load um, pretty seamlessly. So in this use case, we have, um, we're going to insert rows into a table, and every time this happens, the trigger is going to run to fire off an asynchronous pyramid job. The UDF uh, is going to queue all these URLs to be processed in the job server. Then the PHP worker that you'll see is going to grab jobs out of it, fetch content of the URL passed into it. Then it's going to, you know, possibly do some manipulation on the URL content it grabbed, and then shove this back into the database. Now, this is just a really simple example of how you know all the coordination works, but you can really do anything you want with it. So you can see the create table, you know, URL content, um, you know, nothing fancy here. Then the create trigger. So on every insert that happens, for every row that was inserted, we're going to just run gearman do background. And that's going to be a function named URL get, so which means we have to write a worker that knows how to handle the URL get function. And we're going to send the content of that URL string that was inserted. So this is the worker code. And like that hello world example before, we register a worker, we add a set of job servers. If you pass no arguments, it just means connect to local host for the default port. And we're going to register the function URL get. 
So every job that received, that's being received by the worker is going to run this, this other function down here, URL get fn. And it's going to take the job workload, take the extract the URL from the workload, which in this case is the same thing, it's just a string. Um, some pseudocode, fetch URL, you can use curl or you know other HTTP you know, mechanisms or PHP to you know pull the content in. And then maybe you want to do something useful. Maybe you want to extract more URLs out of that if you're doing like a you know like an indexing where you need to you know spider through all the URLs and some content. Or maybe you want to extract all the image URLs out of it to do some processing on them. Or maybe you're only looking for RSS feeds and you want to do some caching there. So you do something useful, what you know, is where your application comes in. But in this case, we're not going to do anything. Just connect to the MySQL server, um, insert it back into the DB, and you know, just just uh, store that content back in there. So after we created that table and inserted the URLs, we just run, uh, or we insert three rows, insert mysql.com, gearman.org, drizzle.org. Wait a moment, so as soon as that happens, those triggers get fired off, and they're put under the asynchronous queue inside of here. And the workers, say if you have three workers running, they're all gonna pick those up pretty much at the same time. So they're all gonna be, ha be pulling this content concurrently. And if we wait a sec, we'll you know, grab the length of the content out. You know, before it was, of course, just all zeros because we didn't insert any content into there originally. Um, it, the workers populate those tables, so we, uh, we now have some, a little bit of MapReduce-like functionality there because we're you know, splitting that work up and shoving it out to distributed nodes. Looking at a diagram of how that worked and maybe expanding on, on it a little more, so we have the insert URL, you know, we have the trigger that happened. That went into the asynchronous queue of the job server. And then the worker, which is that whole block on the right hand side, we picked up the, the you know, grabbed the URL from some way. Maybe in this case we're looking at did it contain any URLs, maybe we're only looking to index more URLs. If it did, then um, go ahead and insert all those new URLs inside of the trigger. And as you can see, we have a feedback loop now. That thing is going to keep on running and running and running. So you need some, you know, either threshold of, you know, how how much recursion do you want to go into your URLs and track that, or you need to, you know, manage some, you know, put some type of filter on. Like maybe you want only want to follow unique URLs for a particular domain. So if you write a simple worker like this and just let it run, you're going to kill your internet connection pretty quick. So you know. And after we actually, you know, maybe stick some more URLs in, we can do something useful with that data. We can take the the content of the URLs, index it in Sphinx if you're doing a full text search, or maybe we want to take all the image URLs and start caching those, and, you know, do something like Google Images. Um, so as you can see, with a pretty small amount of code, you can prototype up some pretty quick uh, useful applications. The next case, sort of directly related to the, the URL processing is image processing. Let's say, in the case of LiveJournal is one of the, the big uses for this, is you need to generate thumbnails or form some type of image recognition or apply some type of filter to the images. Maybe you're, you know, you're doing some Im image manipulation website where you want to you know, real time show, oh, this is what it would look like with some red eye reduction or this is what it would look like you know, with, with a thumbnail. You don't want to be doing this on your Apache nodes. You want to spread that load out of doing this uh, resizing you know, somewhere else. And basically, you need your own image processing bar. Now, similar to the URL processing, you can use, you know, maybe you're just shoving URLs. You could shove, you know, global file system paths. You know, you could do something like MobileFS or HDFS or anything to, to get the work out there. Or you could even stick blobs in the database, although you're not going to scale if you're driving that kind of thing, but it could be wrong. Um, so, just like the URL worker we wrote, you can write a PHP or worker that uses, you know, GDB or the GD library or Image Magic, anything to do it. And um, there's an example in the PHP uh, Gearman extension to actually do just this, the image manipulation. And um, I'm not sure if many of you are working or going to the MySQL conference too, but in the Expo Hall we have a Gearman booth, and we have a real, uh, you know, real time image manipulation um, demo going there too, if you're interested in 
and seeing the source code for that. So after we do that, store the results in the database or global file system. Um, maybe we're just returning a set of URLs to the client to, you know, that gets sent back in the uh, HTTP response so the web or you know their uh, their web browser can pull those URLs from some other you know set of machines. But the important point is is you're pushing this this code out to a worker process. It's pretty lightweight to do so and you can start those work processes up on any number of machines you need to scale up. So one more use case is log aggregation. Now this has this is where we get into some more MapReduce like uh, functionality in that you have some set of logs that you need to you know spread out there for analysis. You know maybe you're doing clickstreams or um, maybe you just want to do some intense mining of your Apache logs or some other application, and, or maybe you just need one consistent view of all your logs. Maybe you want a real time you know tail dash f on your log file, but doing that from you know a cluster of uh, say 100 Apache front, you know, front line machines, you can, you know, easily aggregate those all into one, into one client. So, setting up a, a Gearman log aggregation system will, you know, give give you this consistent view, possibly on a hash set of logging um, storage nodes, and then you can not only store into that, so you can get some fast writes, but you can also query out of that, and that's where that, you know, MapReduce of you know, Every log storage node is going to do some amount of processing, so you're not depending on just a single machine ripping through a log serially and um, you know waiting forever for this thing to finish. Like I was saying, flexibility to push that code into the storage nodes instead of you know having to do it on the client side, and you start looking at you know if you need some consistency of you know timestamp ordering, you have to look at merge sort algorithms to make sure you're you know as you're reading from all your different um, log storage nodes that you're aggregating the results into one consistent time view. So you may need to pause one, wait, and then you see like the, the front timestamp to you know make sure they're all in order. So looking specifically at, at something like Apache logs, you have Gearman using Gearman to plug into the existing environment, you can do something as simple as uh, tail dash up the access log, type it into the Gearman command line tool. The dash n flag means do one job per line. So for every line that appears, it's just going to fire off another job. Otherwise, it's going to wait until you get an end of file. So that dash n flag is uh, the line in the middle. And then you run it to a function name called log. So, so as the as the access log is, you know, Apache is appending to that, tail dash f is going to pick up one line at a time and just keep sending the stream of, um, of log lines into it. Another way you can do it is a custom log line in your Apache config. You do a little pipe trick. It's pretty much the equivalent thing. Um, just another way to do it if you like using that, that feature in Apache. Or you could write a simple Gearman logging module using the Seed API. And maybe you want to apply some filter at the Apache level um, before you know doing this. Uh, you know, you need to do something more intensive at the Apache side level so you're not shoving everything into, into Gearman. Maybe you're only looking for certain requests. But at the same time, you could even just put in a pipe of, you know, put in pipe grep certain URL maybe you're looking for and pipe that into Gearman. So with a command line tool, you can do some pretty quick and nasty things to, you know, to get this aggregation going. And then we'll have multiple Gearman workers. Maybe you want to partition your log um, into multiple data storage nodes. And you could do things like, I want this to go to function logger one, two, or three, you know, and, and doing some really simple, you know, load distribution on your frontline nodes. Or you could just have multiple workers all pulling and, you know, whatever worker is free is going to be the one that, that picks up that, that logger. So you can do your load distribution at different levels of control there, too. And then once all this is sitting in the data storage nodes, we can pull it back out by writing, you know, various clients to, uh, you know, that can poke into the, into the data. So putting it all together, you have just looking at the, the top half of this is the you know the right part, which is all your Apaches writing for their access logs, clients firing off you know one line per job, and the workers are picking them up, and maybe this log data node is putting it into a you know MySQL node or Postgres node, or maybe you're just using BerkeyDB, or you could even just use a flat file. You know you could just um, fire up 
a Garaman command line worker that just sits there and appends, you know, cat, cats into the end of a file. Now once the data is in there, you want to do something useful with that. You need to, you know, mine it in some way to get some, you know, some analysis to, you know, either debugging or maybe, um, you know, doing some quick stream logic. And you can write workers, um, and you can write any number of workers and clients to do this. To look at those data nodes, you know, maybe you're just running a prep through, maybe you're, you know, you want to have one consistent view and pulling that into a uh, AW stats or Webalizer or something like that. Um, we don't actually have a plugin or, you know, a, a, a patch for AW stats to do this, but it should be pretty easy to do if someone else really needed this. Or maybe you just want to have a tail dash F on all your Apache nodes and you know you want to see you know ten thousand requests a second going through your stream. So those are the three use cases. There are obviously a lot more. Um, in my old job I was using this to build a mail database storage architecture, which sounds kind of strange, but we we're pushing um, you know the all the coordination and the asynchronous queue of, you know, you have all your MX servers pumping data into, you know, rather than going into simple mailboxes on a shared file system, we were pumping this thing into a Gearman um, job server, and then it would relay into workers, you know, that are partitioned up per mailbox, so, you know, it, it gives you, like, some natural partitioning of your data, you know, it's kind of like smart sharding up and sort of throwing around, too where you know you're putting your data in then you're writing worker nodes to also do things like full text search on just a, a, a partition of your mailbox and that can return some result set or if you wanted you know grab your inbox you could you know well what we were doing was having all your workers just return their portion then we basically do it in, a, in sorted order and we would do a more merge sort on all those uh, email messages coming back by a unique identifier and then poof we have you know, a webmail client that can can pull in, you know, one consistent view of data. So persistent queues are a big thing that everyone's still asking, like, what if I throw an asynchronous job in there and the job server dies? Right now it's all memory, so you lose the job. But the persistent queue code is done. I just need to merge it in with the trunk. Um, it's gonna be pluggable, so you can keep your persistent queue in a flat file, a database, um, you know, per QDB, whatever you want. I'm going to have a couple of default modules probably to talk to MySQL and Drizzle and maybe um, do like a BDB or Tokyo cabinet um, just because that's really good to depend on the queue. We are still working on more language interfaces. Uh, the C library is done, but we still want to get some, some more native clients like Ruby and Lua, some more uh, clients that are, you know, I know people will be asking for in the future. The, one sore spot, especially uh, working at Sun, is we don't have a Java interface yet. Um, if anyone really is interested in Gearman and really likes Java, come talk to me because we're sort of looking for someone because we're mostly C programmers. We need, uh, still need some improved event notification. Um, we actually just had a little hackathon this week with some of the Perl guys at Six Apart who are still working on Gearman. And, we came up with some new protocol hooks that will allow us to do things like, give me a stream of all the debug messages coming out of the server, or every time a job fails, let me know. So you can do some you know, easy analysis and notification system, and getting better statistics out of it too, like how many jobs are in my queue right now? You know, what was the average response time for this particular job? You know, there's a number of things you can look for when you start looking at you know, queuing algorithms and systems. Uh, one of the things we're gonna use it for in Drizzle is uh, a replication module, so if you're going to be using replication in Drizzle at some point in the future, it's just going to be a big Gearman cluster, and you can have multiple um, Drizzle, but basically the slave servers of Drizzle are going to be pulling master events, and they're just going to be Gearman workers pulling jobs down. And at some point, one of the things I'm really interested in doing is kind of making a, a website or or at least an interface that people can deploy on their websites where you can you know, kind of do a point click map reduce where here's my client code, here's my worker code, just upload them, and you kind of get a, a hosted Gearman cluster where it says, okay, we'll give you, you know, five worker nodes and we're gonna start up all your workers out on those nodes. And, you know, then you kind of have your own little 
one little MapReduce cluster just by uploading two PHP strips. So it's really you know low cost of entry to you know to get going with Pyramid. That interface is probably you know at least a year or two or out, but it's something I'd like to work on at some point. So if you have any questions or um, concerns or just looking at ideas of what this is this a good idea for Gearman um, or is it not, you know, just send me an email. Um, I'm always on the Gearman channel. Um, the uh, Gearman.org is the website. We have a mailing list, uh, um, Google Groups. And we have, like I said, we have a booth down in the Expo Hall giving little demos of different applications we can do. So that's about it if anyone has any questions. Uh, what is the um, wire format look like? The wire format? It's it's a binary protocol. Um, it's it was originally developed by some Perl guys. I'm a Perl programmer too, so nothing against Perl people, but there were some pure Perl people, so efficiency wasn't their top concern. But it actually isn't too bad. You're wasting a few bytes in there that are kind of obvious. Um, but it's really low overhead. Um, if you want to send like a two you know, byte workload, you only have an overhead of, you know, like maybe 12 bytes. So it's not too bad. Um, it's pretty lightweight. Uh, uh, how do you do routing to interesting nodes? The, so we, the Gearman job server doesn't do any real routing. It, it has a list of all the workers that are connected to it. And there's a hash table inside the, the job server per function. So when a job comes in, it looks in this hash table, says, you know, give me the linked list of workers for the, you know, function name reverse. Gets that list back and it says, okay, if, you know, any of these workers are idle, send a wake up message to them. And and that's really all the routing that happens in the jobs. In your second example, though, you had three different data stores for the logs. Yep. Close, it was, you know, lexicographically, A through, J goes to the first one. Yeah. So suppose I need to send a request to the A. Would I just use a different function name? Yeah. Yeah. So you can use those function names. Um, they're actually UTF-A compatible. Um, you can't send null characters because that's what they're terminated by. So you can send. You know, you can overload the function name to do all your partitioning. This is what uh, I was working on doing with that mail storage architecture. Um, we were just going to have a set of nodes, um, like you know, three. I think we were doing like three partitions per, you know, like mailbox. And we were just, you know, doing like mail one, two, and three, and that was our, you know, that was our partitioning scheme. Yeah. Is there something you can uh, batch the longer uh, the level of the worker side? To pull one job at a time? To pull multiple jobs yeah. from the worker side? Yeah. No, um, the workers will only pull one at a time. Uh, it's sort of making an assumption that the workers are a little, you know, they're going to do something significant, and you don't want to have one worker responsible for too many jobs at once because if that worker dies, then you have to that's that many more jobs that need you to start. And when you think about it, the worker can only run one job at a time, so you're you're basically doing, pushing a queue down to a worker where maybe there's another worker that can already do it. So I can see what you're saying; it could be really useful if you have really small payloads and really simple processing, but. It doesn't. But on the client side, it's all pipeline. So you can connect and you can shove, you know, if they're really small jobs, you know, you can shove 10 jobs to be done in a single TCP packet. So that's really fast getting them into the job server, but workers do pull on each time. Is there a way to uh, enforce any uh, dependencies on kind of a. Like when one function finishes, like yeah, have another one restart? Um, the application can do that. Um, you can have a worker. After it finishes a particular job, you can say, okay, I'm done now, fire off another uh, Gearman client. So I actually had an interesting conversation about just this, um, where someone needed that dependency tracking, like, I want this new job to start up only after these five jobs finish. Now, the core of Gearman doesn't know, it doesn't have any of that context. That's, an, that's one layer up from what, you know, that core Gearman stuff provides. I could see it being really useful so for someone to implement an API, you know, just one layer on top of this, that's generic enough to be able to use in a number of applications to provide that dependency track. But Gearman itself, like, that's something that belongs, belongs one layer up, but you can build a system to do that on top of this. Is there, is there a way to do an affinity of, of a function to a particular node? 
Uh, I'm not sure if I. Like for example, I want this job to be run uh, run by this worker. Uh, you can do that by a unique function name. You can have a maybe you have your worker start up um, either temporarily or some way. Maybe it registers a function name that's a UUID. So you kind of mostly guarantee uniqueness. Um, but sort of the nature of Yearman is to not have to isolate or depend on a single worker up there. Um, if you're doing that, you usually want to rethink your application because you just introduced a single point of failure into your application. So monitoring a Yearman process, uh, how far out is well, it depends what type of monitoring. Right now, they're really simple stats. Like, you can run status and see a quick dump of your functions. Um, so the Gearman port, you can just tell it to it. And the Gearman job server knows if you're speaking binary or plain text. So you just tell it to the port and type status, and it'll give you this dump. And it has a function, um, how many workers are listening to it, how many jobs are in the queue, and how many jobs are currently actually being worked on. So you can get simple things like that, but um, at the hackathon we had the other night, we have talking about doing basically a whole tree dump, so you can pipe that into you know something that can aggregate those results back and display it, and you know maybe writing Nagios plugins or or you know doing some other analysis of those themselves. So you could even write Gearman workers and jobs to pull that out and analyze your Gearman status. <laughs> What's the point of it if you have a worker pulling up work to be done and then returning a result, but somehow it crashes? If the worker crashes? Yeah. Um, the job server detects the TCB disconnect and will just restart that job to another worker. Yeah. Are all the workers uh, completely separate from the job server? I mean, uh, if I want to start up generalizing box, uh, I have to start up job server. And neither is start up all the workers, or they are started somehow letting you from job server. Um, yeah, th this is this is a deployment issue. Um, you know, you would need to, you know, basically put in your, you know, in an RC scripts, um, you know, to start up a Gearman D on your job servers and start up a pool of workers, you know, every time the machine boots. So, yeah, there's no. Um, way to manage that right now is kind of up to the application. So workers are not executed, I have to start them off manually, right? Yes, yes, so the, the workers, um, even though they look like a TCP client, they're actually running as a daemon. So in that in that PHP example, I was using the PHP command line tool, and that's running actually as a daemon. It, it starts up and it sits there in an infinite loop just waiting for a job. So they're not being forking except for every single job, so you don't have that over. Any other questions? Yeah. How many people are working on Pyramid at Sun and elsewhere? Uh, so I'm the only one really working on it at Sun, and Sun has no affiliation with it really at all. It's just we're doing it as a because we want it for Drizzle. Um, it's just kind of for Drizzle more than anything. At least how we're that's how we're describing it. Um, and there's some people at Six Apart that still work on the Perl version, and they're still actively. Um, you know, contributing towards that, but they haven't made releases in a while. And Brian Aker, he's also, I'm working with a C version of him. Uh, James Ludke, he wrote the PHP extension, and he's really responsive on, you know, maintaining that. And we're still looking for some community members to, here, write a Python wrapper. There, there's an existing Python module, but we want a new Python interface, like on top of the C library, to wrap that, and like the Java one. So we're still looking for some community members to, you know, gather in for these other languages. But um, like the Garmin IRC channel usually has 20, 15, 20 people hanging around on it right now. So it's it's a growing community though. We started the channel about three months ago, and the mailing list is pretty active too. So yeah. Uh, you kind of mentioned before. Do you typically start up the number of workers you can for a core you have in your machine, or that's completely depends on application. If you're going to be I.O. bound, maybe you want to start a thousand workers on one single core machine. You know, if you're going to be CPU bound, you probably want to keep that pretty even. Maybe, if, you know, double the amount of cores just to make sure you're always saturating it, but completely depends on your application. So, yeah. Is there any limit to the, the amount of data which you can pass? Uh, there isn't, actually. Um, well, there's a core buddy 
uh, integer in the packet. So you can't go more than four gigabytes. But keep in mind the job server is keeping all this in memory. So if you're passing a four gig or you know, even like 100 meg job server, that's 100 megs in your job server that's going to sit in your queue. So in like the image processing pipeline example, if I wanted to actually take my image and yep. send it, you can do that. I, I can yeah. do that. Yeah, yeah, you can totally do that. Um, if you're doing multiple uh, image pro like multiple levels, you may want to stick it somewhere and just send a pointer to that, right. so the workers don't aren't all shoving. You know, like, say if you're doing five image resizes on it, you don't want to send your image five times to five different workers in five jobs. So you kind of could set it somewhere aside and say, here, go look here for the image and do it, and let some global file system manage it. But I could push, um, you know, 200 meg. Uh, job server just testing it and whatnot and couldn't have any problem. But if you're running the Perl server, um, I think I pushed like a hundred meg object through it and it took just just to pass the job along, I think the Perl server took uh, like fifty seconds to do it, just all the mem copying. But the C server it's um, all non blocking IO and everything so it just doesn't clog anything up inside of the job server. So it just passes right through it like zero time. <coughs> Um, how can an administrator deal with a situation where there's a zombie processor or a zombie job that never completes? So this kind of gets back into the monitoring of it. Of you'd want to take a look, and if you see jobs sitting in your queue for a particular function, and there are no workers registered for it, then you know you may want to monitor for that. But as long as you have a worker running, it's always going to get run. Um, you know, as long as all the workers aren't blocked. So. It kind of depends on application, but you can monitor for that situation. Yeah. Just by timeout on the, uh, the worker? You can. Um, so it, well, you you actually do it the way, it, I don't like the way it was done, but this is how it was done before, so I may add in features to, you know, do different timeout options and just hear it itself. But the worker can register a function and say, don't let me run for more than 10 seconds. And it works pretty well, but sometimes you don't want that coming from the worker. You want that coming from the job server. But the job server is the one actually enforcing it, so you can have some time about it. Um, one other really quick thing is we're also adding in SSL, TLS, and authentication. So if you do need to run these on an untrusted network, um, you'll be able to do it in the future. Right now, it's wide open plain text, so um, it's meant to be really fast and efficient and run in a trusted environment, kind of like Memcached. E. Like, you don't want this thing running like open a wide open port because then suddenly anyone can send things into your browser. So, on a slightly related note, is there any checksumming of the data on the wire? Or not right can... now. Not right now, but you can um, at the application level you can check some of your payload. If it's really important, but we didn't want to introduce that overhead for everyone that didn't need it. Want to do that for it. Yeah, yeah, like. <laughs> Yeah, we're actually going to have, we're using Google protobuffers to pass those replication events around. Then we're going to have a checksum on that serialized protobuffer block. So. Yeah? Is it possible to use gear for the case? For example, on the line, I want some job to be done, but I don't want results immediately. I have a job ID. Yep. I wait for a while, and yep. I ask the job server again yep. if this yep. job is done. So, and, and the yeah, so the job server itself will not maintain state after the job is done. So you probably don't want to ask the job server. But you do get back a unique handle when you uh, ask for a job. So if you're running an asynchronous job, the client returns immediately, but you have some job handle. Or you could generate a UUID on the client side and say, so when the worker gets that UUID, it can generate the, the result, the client goes away, and then it may stick it in memcached or MySQL or something like that, and the client can query that intermediate data store in between. I would like to have job server responsible for that. You can do it as long as the job is actively running, but you don't want Gearmandy um, tracking all your jobs that have been run, um, because then that list kind of grows indefinitely. Yeah. It could be an interesting option to add in, but traditionally people are using this to do, you know, hundreds of thousands of jobs a day through this, so you just don't want that list to be going. Can you visualize uh, present view? Uh, can you visualize present view? If you go on the uh, uh, German E, and can you see list of queues uh, 
two withdrawals which winds in the process here. Yeah. yeah, so that status command um, will dump, like I said, the number of workers for every function, a number of workers, the number of jobs in the queue, and the number of jobs being worked on. So using those two numbers, you can see how many are actually not running right now. Yeah. You can't actually see the contents of the jobs. What's that? You can't retrieve the contents of the jobs. No, no, that's what the workers. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, sorry. No, well, I'll, we're, we're okay, we'll be at the Gearman booth um, in the Expo Hall, and I'll be around the conference the rest of the week. Um, there's also a Drizzle Developer Day on Friday, and we'll be talking about some Gearman stuff there, too. Um, that's going to be at the Sun Campus on Friday if you are really interested. So, thanks.